now. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. So I want to introduce myself. My name is Veronica Pelicarek, and I grew up in Argentina, and I was the generation of the disappeared and the tortured and the thrown into the, I just saved myself from that uh, destiny by a hair's breadth. So I grew up in Argentina, my parents were Croatian. Um, and then uh, I studied in the States, liberal arts at Syracuse. And then I traveled the world for many, many years until I landed in Canada. Now I'm a Canadian, I've been in Canada <coughs> for 32 years. And 22 years ago, I, um, maybe 25 years ago, I worked in Manitoba, in the north of Manitoba, um, in a Cree community for a year as a kind of social worker. And there I saw so much violence that I decided to give my life to the study and the practice of nonviolence. And that's how I came to this organization or where, of which I'm a part, which is called Pache Bene because it started as a Franciscan organization. <coughs> now it kind of evolved. And we are a small organization, but for a small organization, we do immense amount of things. I have a book to my name called Engaging Nonviolence. I have two actually, <laughs> Nonviolence and another one. And my role with this organization, as I said, I've been with the organization for 22 years, is director of educational programs. I'm a psychologist. And, um, so I love the work that I do this year with the online, I've taught 500 people, no more, a thousand, I don't remember. But, um, you know, from all over the world, we teach courses. And our, our direction is basically strategic and principle nonviolence <clears throat> in kind of Gandhi, Martin Luther King, you know, um, right now, of course, there are many, many activists, uh, but we are very kind of focused on Kingian nonviolence also. And we are, what we are really doing now is working to create nonviolent cities. Many Carbondale started, Carbondale, Illinois started uh, naming themselves a nonviolent city and other cities follow. Now we have about 20 cities who name themselves as nonviolent cities. And this is a process, you know, like working with the police, um, trying to replace in schools, you know, the police by people who are kind of like, willing to be more like, um, like uh, kind of uh, helpers, if you want to call it. There's a lot, a lot going on right now, obviously, given the times that we're living in as regards climate change. And so I, um, what I feel is that we are evolving. We are not yet what we want to be in terms of mainstreaming nonviolence. We're creating a place uh, to go to as an alternative to all the violence that we see all over the place. We are still not there. It's, you know, it's been a long time. We've existed for 32 years and, and yet there is still so much work ahead. But we're getting there. This year, we managed to organize 4,400 actions. It takes a lot of organizing to do that. You know, like people kind of doing little little marches and, and little actions in schools and things like that in order to promote nonviolence as an alternative. Because we, we talk a lot. We don't like violence. We like peace. But somehow, we are still going to war in order to get peace. Right. This is we we have to switch something in our minds. And I think the first place to start is really by transforming our own inner violence and educating ourselves, because otherwise the world doesn't have a chance. I don't know uh, what you think about it, but I think we are in a huge, enormous mess at a planetary level. And um, we could talk about that. 
but I, I'm imagining that all of you realize that there is some truth to what I'm saying on many, many levels, you know, economic, uh, ecological, educational, medical, there's a crisis in every single field of human endeavor. And so the question to ask ourselves is, how do we get out of this mess? So actually, as Albert Einstein has said, no problem can be solved by the same consciousness that created it. I'm going to repeat that. No problem can be solved by the same consciousness that created it. So we as human beings have to change our consciousness if we want the outside to change. I've been a Zen student, I'm a Buddhist. I don't name myself anything, but I've been doing Zen practice for 30, 40 years now. And so I get a really good chance to see the violence inside of me. And together with the work that I do, it gives me an opportunity to be part of hopefully the forces of change and creation and not the forces of chaos. So, sorry. Did somebody ask me a question? Huh? I can't hear you very well. Uh, uh, well. So, well, Most everybody questions? here is muted. Just keep going, okay? Go okay, ahead. thank you so much. So basically, I want to turn a little bit with the theme of where does change happen and how does it actually happen? And to bring up a few of the Gandhian principles, one of the principles uh, that he mostly believed in is that we have to do a constructive program. It's not enough to resist you have to create the alternative, right? So the constructive program, he called it. And resistance, and you all practically, I'm sure you all know the Gandhi story, and the resistance is fundamentally a non-cooperation with the forces of destruction and, and, and chaos. So you, we as human beings need to look at ourselves and see how we are cooperating with the things that we condemn and complain about and uh, disagree about and all of this. How are we in our daily lives, in our attitudes, in our gestures, in our thoughts, how do we cooperate with that? And what are we gonna do about it? Because otherwise, you know, there's not much of a chance. So it's up to the individual because once the individual changes, then relationships change so that the relationship with other people changes and then the social global changes. And as we were talking, consciousness is the fundamental element that allows that change to happen. Awareness, um, the capacity to be a witness to your own behavior, to put it in very concise terms. So um, I, I, um, I want to share with you a very simple exercise. And I really do invite you, if you would be so kind, to, um, to do the gesture that I'm going to show you with me. This exercise is called the Two Hands of Nonviolence and was inspired by the writings of the late Barbara Deming, who was a feminist and an activist. In her book, Revolution and Equilibrium, Deming's metaphor of the two hands underscores the creative tension that fuels both interpersonal transformation and social change, because it's both things that we're gonna try here and look at. Interpersonal relationships, how can we be brothers and sisters to each other? You know, which is a good thing. It's a beautiful thing, I mean, when you can really be a force for good and you generate that around you, your life becomes so much happier, right? I'm not an evangelical preacher, but I'm just speaking from experience, right? So these are the two hands of nonviolence. So with one hand, 
we say to one who is angry or to an oppressor or to an unjust system, stop what you're doing. I refuse to honor the role you're choosing to play, which would be what you would be doing, Ellen. I refuse to obey you. I refuse to co cooperate with your demands. I refuse to build the walls and the bombs. I refuse to pay for the guns. With this hand, I will even interfere with the wrong you're doing. I want to disrupt the easy pattern of your life. But then the advocate of nonviolence raises the other hand. You see my other hand is stretched out like that? Raises the other hand. It is raised outstretched, maybe with love and sympathy, maybe not, but always outstretched. With this hand, we say, I won't let go of you or cast you out of the human race. I have faith that you can make a better choice than you're making right now. And I'm here when you're ready. Like it or not, we are part of each other. So those are the two hands of nonviolence. Do you see them? I'm gonna ask you, please, we're gonna do it together. And I'm gonna ask you, I would love to see you while you're doing it, if you could come back to the screen somehow, if you will. There's no, I'm, it's just a request. So these are the two hands of nonviolence. So suppose somebody, thank you, Kelvin. So suppose somebody is really being very difficult and annoying and violent towards you. So the first thing that you do as a gesture, you say, you know, the buck stops here, you, you go with this hand and feel what happens in your body. When you do this gesture, your whole body is an expression of that hand in terms of taking your position and standing in your truth. But you don't stop there. You extend the other hand because we are part of each other and feel what happens in your body. When you extend the other hand, there is an opening of your heart, hopefully, and there is a willingness to be a bridge to better understanding and better cooperation together. So these are the two hands of nonviolence. And feel the power of that because the hands occupy an enormous space in the brain, you know. So I want to tell you a story regarding the thank you so much, Joseph, too, for participating and everybody who participated. So we do want a better world where we can live in harmony and where our children can grow up in peace and not repeat the eternal theme of like, uh, I kill you or you kill me kind of thing. And so I'll tell you a story of what happened with the two hands of nonviolence. Uh, I speak obviously many languages, uh, six actually. And so I taught a lot in Argentina. Like. Huh? So like. And so, I taught a lot in South America because my native tongue is Spanish. So I was teaching many years ago in Caracas, in Venezuela, to a group of people who were anti Chavez. You know, everybody knows who Chavez is? Yeah? Okay. So these people, because they wanted to be very noble, they invited a whole group of Chavistas to the workshop. It was a three-day workshop. And um, they invite, They were about 50, 60, and they invited, say, 40 Chavistas. And we were all together there in the room for three days, and I taught nonviolence and things like that. And all of a sudden, there was this girl called Leonor, who was working with another girl, Maria. Leonor was anti-Chavez and this girl, Maria, was pro-Chavez. 
And they were working together, the two hands of nonviolence, because I make people work it, you know, in pairs. And she couldn't raise the other hand. She couldn't stretch the hand to Maria. She just couldn't. She started shaking. It was really interesting to watch. She just couldn't extend to the other woman. She hated the other woman so very much that she couldn't, even in an exercise, extend her hand. And we were all mesmerized. We were watching there, like what was happening. Eventually, in my memory, she did do a little kind of gesture of stretching towards her. Then next day, she went to a demonstration, a demonstration again of pro-Chavez people mm -hmm. and anti-Chavez you know, Chavez people. And they were at a line, they were at a line. And the woman who was pro-Chavez, because you know, Chavez was the first person who gave the people of Venezuela a constitution. Before Chavez, you can like or not like Chavez, this is out, not the question here. But actually Chavez gave dignity to people who never had a constitution. It was all ruled by very rich people. And so, so this woman, Maria, you know, she was shouting to Leonor, you know, you selfish little bitch, uh, horrible, horrible things like that, you know, across the line. And Leonor was pretty scared that, um, that she would get to hit her. And all of a sudden, she doesn't know how, but out of her heart, she stretched her hand to Maria. And in doing this, the other woman was so shocked that this you know, anti-Chavez person was stretching her hand to her, that she took it and they both stood there crying. And the interesting thing is that Leonor writes it. I'm trying to find, I wrote this article, but um, Leon, and, and the thing about it is Leonor's life was completely changed since that day. She was so much more compassionate, she understood so much better the plight of the poor and got very interested in social work, et cetera, et cetera. And so we can think that a simple gesture or an exercise is a small thing, but actually it's huge. It can be huge in the psyche of one person. I want to read here um, something that Pam McAllister, uh, has written about nonviolence. What has drawn me most strongly to nonviolence is, is its capacity for encompassing a complexity necessarily denied by violent strategies. By complexity, I mean the sort faced by feminists who rage against the system of male supremacy, but at the same time love their fathers sons, husbands, brothers, and male friends. I mean the complexity which requires us to name an unpaid working man who beats his wife, both as someone who is oppressed and as an oppressor. Violent tactics and strategies rely on polarization and dualistic thinking and require us to divide ourselves into the good and the bad assume neat, rigid little categories, easily answered from the barrel of a gun. Nonviolence allows for the complexity inherent in our struggles and requires a reasonable acceptance of diversity and an appreciation of our common ground. So that's what happened to Leonor. She found that common ground. She went beyond the complexity. Thank you, Janice. Ubuntu, I am here because you are here. I exist because you exist. So this is exactly, you know, like, this is exactly what they understood in South Africa when they did the peace and reconciliation. It's like, it's useless just creating more enemies enough you know, or creating the enemy, how can we, without condoning the actions of a person, how can we 
stretch out the other hand and say, you're part of me. I will not throw you out of my heart. You know, it was very interesting because I, last night I had a huge argument with my sister in Argentina. You know, I work this every day, you know, I am a huge, it was very painful for me, argument with my sister. And then today I spoke to my brother, both of them are in Argentina. And I said, you know, I have to send my sister a lot of love because really like at this moment, I dislike her so much, you know? So this is the complexity, you know, of the situation. And, and this is how you work with yourself to transform yourself. Now, many of you might not really agree with me that nonviolence is an alternative. So I'm going to tell you another story and I will invite you and put it in the chat um, to watch a video by Erica Chenoweth. Erica Chenoweth now teaches at Harvard. Um, I think uh, she teaches um, political something or other, but she started, she was in the army and uh, she started to be a really believer in violence until one of her friends, Maria Stefan, challenged her, challenged her to investigate nonviolence and see what she would find. So from that challenge came this book. Hold on, I'm coming. From that challenge came out this book, which is a very academic book, actually, that's called Why Civil Resistance Works. Why Civil Resistance Works by Erica Chenoweth. I'll put the link afterwards. It's, a, it's called The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. And so Erica Chenoweth started studying nonviolent, um, nonviolent movements. And she realized it's very scientific and academic book. I mean, this is not theory, you know, pie in the sky type of thing. This is science, you know, this is the best. And she discovered in her analysis and stuff like that, that nonviolent movements are, are twice as effective as, as violent ones. She studied 10 different movements around the world. And she discovered that nonviolent movements are twice as effective as violent ones. How come we're not teaching our kids that? I ask you, how come? I mean, she wrote another book, which is more for the lay person. And, the, and here she talks about, if three only, say 3.5 of a population stands up against an unjust system, they cannot win. Just 3.5 of the population stands up against an unjust dictatorship or ruler or you know like tyrant they will succeed but you need the but because the thing about nonviolence that is so fantastic is that everybody can participate it's creative it's participatory it's democratic kids all people like myself everybody can participate in nonviolence, and this is what was a genius of somebody like Gandhi and Martin Luther King. He included everybody. I don't know if you've seen the Children's March, <laughs> you know, like you can look it up, it is there for us to discover. But we are so habituated in, and it's such, such a deep, profound level that violence works when it doesn't. But we are so conditioned to believe that violence works. Yeah, war resistors lead. Yeah, and so we need to change at that level and, and really see that there is another way, you know, that, and this is what I think Erica Chenoweth um, shows. There is a TED talk by her when she was very young. She was still at the University of Denver. She's young. Erica must be maybe 42. 43. And there is a fantastic TED talk of Erica Chenoweth, where she explains how she came to nonviolence. Hi, Margaret and Frank. I haven't said hello to you. Thank you for no, being no, here. No, no. Sorry, we're late. We had a little problem here it's getting set up. 
<laughs> That's okay. I'd love to welcome people and, and thank you for your interest. So, so this is the way the world could be. The world could be a place of cooperation and where we could all work together to bring forth something better, you know, that does not destroy other species, animals, plants, you know. And so the path of nonviolence, for me, fundamentally, why I am so, for me, nonviolence is, is a way to grow spiritually too. I've always been interested in, in spirituality Buddhist, you know, but in a way it is, a, it, um, John Baez said, nonviolence is organized love. I love that. Nonviolence is organized love. And that's what it is. And if you ask anybody who, who will be sincere with you and who, there are three things that are very important to people. They dress it up, you know, they deny it. But, but when you go down to it, you know, you know that these are the three things that are most important to human beings. Belonging, right? meaning, right? And to love and be loved. Bottom line, you know, belonging, meaning. And the interesting thing is nonviolence is for people who truly walk that path, it has those three things. Belonging to a community of like-minded people is, it's a fantastic thing. You know, like I can, in my staff meetings and with my my colleagues and stuff like that i can truly speak my mind and i know i will not be judged or hated for it and there is an incredible freedom in that kind of respect so it's not the belonging out of oh you know we so love each other no it's the belonging of honesty which is so beautiful and respect you know and trust is that kind of belonging, right? And meaning is like, we all want a better world for our grandchildren. Let's be honest, right? So we are creating that. And obviously, you know, all you need is love, like the Beatles said. There's no question about it. And the older you get, the more you know how true that is, right? And so, so the, the path itself, keeps revealing itself as you walk it. You know, the path acquires meaning as you walk this path and you grow with it and you come closer to what Gandhi called the soul force that sustains you even in the hardest of circumstances. You know, for most people, and tell me if I'm wrong, you, we're gonna have, you know, time for questions and tell me if I'm wrong, but in the face of violence, most of us do three things. We either accommodate, you know, you can see this throughout history, we accommodate, or we avoid, or we counterattack. That's the three things we do when faced with violence, right? We accommodate, we avoid, and we counterattack, never thinking that there is another alternative, which is the training in nonviolence, which is what we are suggesting in this talk tonight, that there is an alternative, which is the alternative of nonviolence. And so when we accommodate, we say, oh, you know, it's not so bad, it's okay, but no. And therefore we are allowing for evil to fester and to grow. And all of a sudden, before we know it, we lose our liberties and our human rights, right? Too much accommodation also creates a kind of hypnosis where we no longer see the truth because we are in this hypnotic state. You know, let's not make waves, right? So avoid is the same thing, more or less, but a different kind of slant on it, which is, the, uh, oh, let the police take care of it. You know, I grew up in a military dictatorship, 
you know, first it was Peron, and then there was a military government and stuff like that. So I saw at very close quarters, what happens in a, not, it wasn't totalitarian, it was dictatorship. There is a difference between a totalitarian regime and a dictatorship. You know what the difference is? A totalitarian regime, say Hitler, Stalin, or whatever, as a totalitarian regime grows, yeah, I love that book by Chris Hedges. It's a great book, great book. As, as the totalitarian regime gets more and more power and it grows and grows, it becomes more and more cruel. It's one of the outstanding features of a totalitarian regime that becomes more and more cruel, think Stalin. You know, by the end, Stalin had killed 50% of its own people, right? And other than 40 million, I don't know, Poles or whatever, right? It becomes more and more cruel. A dictatorship, on the other hand, and this is a subtle but interesting difference. A dictator becomes softer and softer because all of a sudden he too realizes that he needs to be loved. So a dictator, with the passage of time, softens up, right? And I saw this with Peron, who was a total dictator, you know, don't cry for me, Argentina, you know, Peron, that Peron. And so uh, he became kind of more of a, a figure, you know, like I used to go to school and I went to an Irish nun school, you know, private, and our, our, our copy books, our reading books, all started with a photo of El, El Evita Peron with a halo around her head. Can you, no kidding, no kidding. And the nuns, the Irish nuns had to live with that, you know? But Evita was this kind of like, you know, I don't know where he picked her up, but you know, like in some kind dance floor for sure. And then she, he dressed her up and she became this kind of like icon where you opened your copy book and there she was with a halo around her head. So, you know, love me, please love me, right? I'm, I'm, I'm your benefactor, you know. So, um, I want to also talk to you about, because most people um, think that violence is innate to us you know, Lawrence and all of that. We are all intrinsically geared to be violent. This is our fundamental makeup. It's intrinsic to the oh. human being, right? Well, this is not so. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call to you, I'm gonna tell you why this is not so. Um, there is in the United Nations educational, scientific and cultural sector, there is what is called the Seville Statement, the Statement of Seville, right? And the Statement of Seville is like a meeting that happened maybe in 1990, <laughs> something like that, in Seville, Spain, where these scientists from all different disciplines, biology, chemistry, psychology, uh, medicine, all, all different, got together to really study if it is true, if it is intrinsically true that um, bio biological, we are made to be violent. And they started saying like that, we the undersigned scholars from around the world and from relevant sciences have met and arrived at the following statement on violence in it, we challenge a number of alleged biological findings that have been used even by some of our disciplines to justify violence and war, just war theory and all of that kind of thing. And then they go to say, they make 10 propositions that it is scientifically incorrect that we have inherited tendency to make war from our animal ancestors. Two, it is scientifically incorrect to say that war or any other violent behavior is genetically programmed in our human nature. Three, it is scientifically incorrect to say 
that in the course of human evolution, there has been a selection for aggressive behavior more than for other kinds of behavior. Four, it is scientifically incorrect to say that humans have a violent brain. While we do have the neural apparatus to act violently, it is not automatically activated by internal or external stimuli. Five, it is scientifically incorrect to say that war is caused by instinct or any single motivation. The emergence of modern warfare has been a journey from the primacy of emotional and motivational factors. Modern war involves institutional use of personal characteristics such as obedience, suggestibility, idealism, social skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And here is the conclusion of all of these scientists. We conclude that biology does not condemn humanity to war and that humanity can be freed from the bondage of biological pessimism, pessimism and empowered with confidence to undertake the transformative task needed in the international year of peace and in years to come. Although these tasks are mainly institutional and collective, they also rest upon the consciousness of individual participants for whom pessimism and optimism are crucial factors. Just as wars begin in the minds of men, peace also begins in our minds. The same species who invented war is capable of inventing peace. The responsibility lies with each of us. So the big question is, how do you want to live? And well, I was just about to suppose every one of us here is the descendant of a warlord. I did inside, not our, inside every one of our genetics is either Genghis Khan or somebody else I know. who was a warlord. So don't tell me that uh, there's no biological imperative to be the alpha male through is violence. That, well... I mean, we can discuss, from, I'm just quoting what all these scientists says. If you think- Well, well yeah, well, you know what, those, those scientists, every one of those scientists were descendants of a warlord. Are, 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 Veronica, are you done with your presentation now or do you still got more to do? Who is speaking to me right I now? I am, Tim Bolger. Uh, hi, Tim, hi, Tim. So I thought I had to do for about 40 minutes. I can stop now or I can go- No, on. no, it's up I, to I'm you. Sorry, you I, thought, I'm sorry, I thought you threw it up to questions already, sorry. No, no, it's it's okay. If you well, why don't you go ahead and finish, Veronica? If you got more you want to speak about, please go ahead. If you want to open it up for questions, I'll leave that up to you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So basically, I'm just gonna go for five more minutes. Basically, what Erica Chenoweth, who as I said, she teaches at Harvard, and so many other people who have created groups like World Without War and Nonviolent Peace Force, uh, Gandhi had this idea to create a peace force where people would go to areas of conflict and instead of killing other people, they would, through accompaniment and other strategies, they would stop wars and they have. Nonviolent Peace Force is backed by the United Nations. I'm a member of Nonviolent Peace Force. And so, yes, there is a conditioning that is very strongly embedded in us. But as these scientists have shown, as Erica Chenoweth has proven, she was not a believer. She got to, to her conclusions through deep, deep investigation. I mean, she dedicated her life to this, right? I mean, we have lots of opinions, but what are they based on? You know, mostly, mostly in just something that it's, it's something we like to kind of like say, but go to people who have really studied the matter, like an Erica Chenoweth and these people, and they maybe have something to teach us. So, and, and the world, as I said before, anybody who has eyes to see, we are in danger on so many levels. And unless we change course, I don't think we have much of a chance, honestly. So, we have to teach our children to, 
think different, to cooperate instead of compete. We have to teach our children and an experiment. And with this, I will end. An experiment was made with kids in England by a guy called Davidson, I think. So he got two groups of kids, right? And one kid, he taught them to cooperate. And another group of kids, he taught them to be very aggressive. And then put all the kids in a, to watch a movie and gave the kids candy. So all of a sudden, the movie was cut and the candy was taken away. Great frustration, right? But lo and behold, the kids that had been taught to cooperate and to be kind were consoling the other kids who were aggressive and frustrated and screaming and bantering and all of this kind of thing that kids will do when they're frustrated. These kids that had been taught to be loving and cooperative immediately put their behavior to the task. So as what I read to you said, the same mind that has created war can create peace. Thank you. Okay, does that mean you're all uh, done now, Veronica? Okay, everybody can now unmute and let's go to our question period. So uh, Veronica, the first question I'm gonna ask you was, are you familiar with the Albert Einstein Institute and the work of Gene Sharp? Of course, of course, the 108. Really? Yes. Um, I've, I've actually read Dic from Dictatorship to Democracy and actually did a presentation on it here at the college. About oh, I'm so happy. That's so great. I've got it here. It's a small little book, right? Yellow. Yeah. It's a great little book. And there, yeah, he talks about all of this. Yes. He, we owe so much to Gene Sharp. You know, the dictator Milosevic in Serbia, Right. You know, the guys that brought him down, they were all students of uh, Gene Sharp. And I, I had also heard, too, that they did the same thing, that they were instrumental in getting behind the Arab, up, the That's Arab right. Spring in, uh, in the Middle East around 2011. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you, Tim. That's great. Yeah. Now, the, my, my question is, you know, that Arab Spring started out so well. How come it... Uh, how come there's so many people that don't really get to democracy, but they usually wind up with another form of authoritarianism? I know. Isn't it crazy? Like, as I said, you know, like I had my parents were Croatian and I grew up in Argentina. And um, it is really an interesting phenomenon. I think basically it's conditioning. You know, it's kind of like we cannot see ourselves as free men. We cannot. It's like, like you know, Gandhi... Um, Martin Luther King used to say, my biggest enemy is not the United States government who doesn't want to desegregate and, and give us the vote. My greatest difficulty is the Negro who for 400 years has seen himself as a slave and cannot get out of that mentality. Because it, it is here, you know, it is, you know, neural pathways, right? Neuroplasticity, neural path these neural pathways are no kidding deep. You know, like I see it in myself, you know, when I repeat, though with all my studying, all my training, all my goodwill, when somebody crosses me, my first instinct is dislike the person. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, I dislike it. You know, instead of saying, well, you know, how can I engage? I dislike them intensely. But I train myself, you know, non <laughs> Are you right? Why are you laughing, Godfrey? <laughs> you know, I have to train myself. Yeah, to uh, use President Clinton's thing, I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the thing about that pain, you know, <laughs> that pain that you feel and I feel, and, you know, the pain that you, you don't transform, you will pass it on you will pass it on. That's Richard Rohr's, uh, he said something better said than what I have just said. But you know, you will pass on. What you don't transform in yourself, you will pass on to your children and they will pass it to your grandchildren and to their children, et cetera. And that's how, to answer your question, Tim, that's how. It's untransformed pain, untransformed pain. You know, there was this wonderful series now 
on, um, I loved it, I saw it twice. That was cool. the wisdom of trauma, you know, kind of like Gabor Mate, the guy who works in, um, with uh, traumatized drug dealers and drug addicts and stuff like that in Vancouver, amazing thing. So these two film, filmmakers decided to make a film about Gabor Mate and it's called The Wisdom of Trauma, which we now know that most of the problems in the world is unresolved trauma. You know, we know this. You know how many people watch that? It was transformative, five million. They never thought. You know, they just put out this little movie and then these little things of people talking about trauma. Five million people around the world saw this movie and this. The most stunned were the producers of the film, two Italians. You know, they never saw this. Oh, maybe half a million people we were lucky. No, five million. Because we know instinctively that the trauma in us from childhood, from bad experiences that is not healed will create havoc in our lives and other people's lives. So that's nonviolence to work on your trauma. You know, I just finished up two recent books on, uh, you know, America. One was by Mary Trump and it was all about the history of racism in America. And the other one by, was by Mark Levin called American Marxism. And the one thing I've noticed is just a complete and venal hatred that each group has for one another. And frankly, I don't know how to see a way out of it with the way these guys are getting so militant on each side. Yeah, I want to tell you another story. I love stories, you know. So my mother is Croatian and... Um, I went, to I went to visit Argentina, I was already living in Canada, and there was the, the Balkan War going on. This was years ago. And there was a Balkan War going on, and she's in the kitchen, and she says, Veronica, this is so terrible. A woman has just lost four sons to the, to the war. Imagine losing four children, four sons. I said, yeah, I said, mom, that's war, it's terrible. So she goes, and I go our separate ways and we meet back two hours later and she's reading a painting. Those son of bitches Serbs, we should kill them all. I, this is what she said. And I looked at her, yeah, I bet there's a woman in there who has four sons. I bet. Yeah. Because this uh, is- ch ch if I may interject, uh, right, I, I watched yeah. a bit of a little thing recently, and it was a guy called Bo the Fifth Column, and he was talking about how do you exactly what you said, how do you cross that divide? And he was talking about somebody as controversial as transgender things, right? And he said, at least this guy is is he's so he's southern United States beard, looks like a redneck, he's also ex special forces, and he says. What you say is what you say is we've all had kids. We all know somebody who's taken their kid deer hunting too early. You know, when well, you've done it and the kid's been totally traumatized, stuff like that. We don't tell this kid how to uh, how to raise their child, but we've all known guys that have done this. Mm -hmm. And you say to them, well, I ain't about to tell anybody how to raise their child. The point is, you pick on a point of common morality. You don't tell somebody how to how to raise how, how to raise their child. You say, you know what's right. Work with it. Work with what is common to everybody's sense of right and wrong. That's right. And you know, once I saw a t-shirt at Omega Institute that the teacher said was, you know, like a t around like this on the t-shirt said, I will not raise my child to kill your child. That's right. It's how you raise them. Anybody else that would like a question here? Anything else, Tim? Yeah. Go right ahead, Gian. Yeah, I have a comment and a question. Uh, comment is about the so-called nature and the culture, gene and uh, environment. 
I think uh, within us, we have genes that kind of um, dominant in a way for both violence and collaboration. Uh -huh. But it's it needs a, um, but there's like the environment culture that can uh, either uh, direct, uh, direct that part of human nature to one direction or another. So uh, parents and teachers um, who, who have responsibility to um, bring up healthy and collaborative um, children, adults, have that uh, responsibility to bring out the best in us instead of bring out the more destructive aspect of it. Um, so that's the comment. And my question is about um, nonviolent, the concept of nonviolence and uh, the concept of justice. Mm -hmm. I, I always kind of struggle with the concept of justice because it implies that um, a justice to be done, uh, that implies some kind of revenge. Um, it makes me kind of uncomfortable in thinking about justice um, on two fronts. One front is who is the arbitrator of justice? Yeah. And uh, secondly, when we, uh, and who is the executor of justice? And once the justice is done, what kind of legacy you leave to other people to want to bring out their justice. But this concept has been so ingrained in the society that we glorify it, but we don't question the validity of that concept and the impact of the concept of justice. I love it. I, I have the same issues that you do. I have the same issues. Justice has become one more way of justifying, you know, uh, punishment. So that is, I totally agree with you. I've seen it all over, you know, like this is just, and it's all the time in the movies, you know, when they, they have these, well, that's justice, that's bullshit. You know, where is the human being there? It's just power over. It's just not, you know, like kind of coming to a better place together. It's just power over, right? You're talking about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, and then they will say to you, well, you say, well, that's not fair. That's not just, there's no such thing as justice, you know, or so many answers I've gotten, or there is, you know, divine justice and human justice. I mean, but a very interesting field that has come up lately that I really want to study in more depth. I haven't really, but I would love to, is restorative justice, you know, restorative justice. How do you restore the person to their own innate kind of goodness and stuff like that. And it's a whole process and I can't talk about it because I have not studied it in depth, but so many places are already, even they're using it in some prisons and things like that. You know, most people that are in prison are just yellow canaries. They are kind of like, you know, they're in a way victims of a system and of a, of a kind of like imbalance way of seeing life and community. I mean, these are people that are, you know, kind of like, yeah, they're the yellow canaries of our society. So in those contexts, they're they're in storm, restore that restores the human dignity in a human. One of the most important things for a human being is dignity. That restores the dignity. And from that dignity, you can say, I'm sorry, or how can I make amends or whatever, from that place of dignity. But if you're doing power over a person, you're squashing the person, right? You, it's very difficult to come to that place of dignity. That, that brings up the other question. Um, I used to support um, like desperate um, uh, sentence, but I don't, uh, I don't support it anymore. I think if we think um, every life in a way is sacred, although sometimes they are misplaced. Um, but uh, who is like the concept of justice? Who has a power to take away someone's life and the di dignity? Um, but I mean, it's controversial. Some people think 
uh, it is a justice, but in a way it's more like a revenge than justice. So if you are standing at a higher plate and you don't um, want to take another round over, over the first round and to make, make a revenge, if you, like you say, the, the uh, restorative justice is from person want to restore himself or herself instead of the, the outside force want to uh, want, want to punish you, right? So it is a higher le level of uh, making the person in, in a traditional religious sense like repent. But if we don't say repent, it's like from inside out, not from ex outside in. But exactly. this, it is a higher play, but it's a harder work to do. But you know, with within the concept of Ubuntu in South Africa, and I've seen 10 hours of those uh, peace and reconciliation commissions and stuff like that, it breaks your heart. I, I mean, you cry. They went through this kind of restorative justice model. And if they saw that a person really repented, but really repented, then the person was left to lead their lives with their own consciences and stuff like that. It, it wasn't as simple as that. Afterwards, you know, there was abuse and there was all kinds of things happening, but it was one intent in human history of doing it another way. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can learn from that. Um, Veronica, um, I'll just a little aside. And uh, Cape Town is such a, 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 a Johannesburg, it's such a wonderful non-violent place to live now, isn't it? Um, <laughs> what I'm going to ask you is, at what point in your non-violent thing do you say, sorry, but that's not a right you have to the aggressive non-violent person? Okay. At what, point, at what point do you say, I'm sorry, you, I'm not going to allow you to do that? I, 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 again, you know, I did that, exactly that about 10, you know, I was friends with somebody for 25 years and there was a- No, 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 I mean, I mean what, 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 what point do you actually physically say you, you do not have the right to do that? Well, I'm, I'm coming to it, if you allow me, yeah. So I was friends for 25 years and all of a sudden I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to end this relationship. I'm going to walk out from this friendship because I, 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 don't, I, don't, I that, that's avoidance. Was what? That's another one you said. That's no, 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 no. Right, excuse yeah. me. Excuse me. Not in. I'm. I'm trying to explain to you. I said, because so many times I mentioned that you know it's not avoidance. We had talked about it. We were blue in the face, but finally there came a point, and I'm this. I'm responding to your question. It came a point where I said. I love you very much, the two hands of nonviolence, but, you know, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm walking out. I mean, all relationships have an expiry date. Uh, 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 yeah, but, but sorry, walking out is avoidance. At what, at what point, if somebody is hitting somebody else, do you, do you uh, or, 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 or being aggressive and uh, 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 bullying somebody else, do you stand up and say, I'm sorry, but you're not allowed to do that. And they say, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to walk out? No, no. Are no. You going to, no at, at what point do you say, because let's face it, we all sleep safely on our beds because there are men and women willing to do violence on our behalf that walk the streets at night. At what, that... point, at what point do you say enough is enough? And you, I, well, I, I, it's a very, can I answer that? If you allow me to answer it, it's a very personal and there is no recipe for that. This is what I was trying to tell you. It's a very personal internal process. Something happened in Montreal the other day at 4.30 in the afternoon in the McGill ghetto, which is, you know, like where the University of McGill is. And a man stabbed to death a 24 year old woman at 4.30 in the afternoon in the street. When I heard that story, because it passed on television, what surprised me most was a woman they were interviewing. She said, yes, I went inside, I saw it. I went inside the house. I told my 
girl, uh, girlfriend's boyfriend to call 911. And for me, I was stunned. I would have started screaming. Other people were there. Nobody screamed, stop it, stop it, you're killing her. Nobody, nobody did. This girl went inside a house while this stabbing was occurring to tell somebody else to call 911. You know, so that person is all that she could do at that moment. I'm not judging, I'm just saying, if we had nonviolent training, I don't say get between the girl and the, and the guy, you know, and the knife, it was done with a knife, she died. You know, like, but I started screaming my head off. I mean, you know? I mean don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, 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 I really took in an awful lot of what you said. And, um, um, I mean, uh, I, and, I, and I, I will totally agree with you. Assertion training and shit, look, that is, there's a whole lot of other ways to go other than violence. But at some point in time. I just want to ask you, Kelvin, what would you have done? <laughs> I'd probably try to, I'd probably try to, try to physically intervene and stop the guy from stabbing him. Right. I wish you would have. I don't know. I'd I, 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 I maybe picked up a weapon and, and tried to stop him, you know? At least you you would have started screaming, right? Like, no, I don't I would have, I, I, I would have, I, I would have weighed in. And, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I would I, I would have wanted to or but if I did you know picked up a, okay. a chair and stuff or, or something like that or whatever. All right. Um okay if you're done, Kevin, Charlie's got the next question. Charlie. Yes, uh first of all, uh before we run out, I want to thank you for a very uh interesting uh presentation on behalf of the College of Complexes and uh uh, the work that you are doing and your organization. Uh, I don't care, well, I don't expect, but are you familiar with the book that came out in the early 60s by Conrad Lorenz entitled On Aggression? It yes. would appear that he was a comparative psychologist. Yeah. And I believe he had uh, different conclusions than the study that you cited. What is your candid opinion, perhaps, of of what he had to say or this issue? Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. For me, you know, science, knowledge, perception, it evolves. Like in 1960, we didn't know about neural pathways. We know more about the brain in the last 20 years and the whole history of humanity. Lawrence, I don't know. I respect him totally. I, I think he has his point, but I think we know more now about the brain. We know more than we did then. You know, we have studied, we can see what happens in the brain on a screen. We can see what happens when I get angry, when I'm sad. He didn't know, he didn't have that in 1960 when he wrote the book. So there is an evolutionary process here. You know, we will know more. We are still, we know so little really, even with all the technology that we have and, and the MRIs and everything else, we know very little. So I say, yeah, he was appropriate for the times, but we've moved on. With the knowledge and the technology and science, we've moved on. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Hello. Hi, Joseph, Joseph Hi, go ahead. All right, Joseph, and then we'll go to Veronica. Go ahead, Joseph. Don't forget to- Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, Veronica, great presentation. I disagree with you, but you are inclusive. Um, ideal, idealistic, humanistic presentation. <clears throat> But with all due respects to you and Gandhi and Martin Luther King, I have to say that they were not necessarily pundits or scientists on the theory of nonviolence. <clears throat> you uh, indicated that certain scientists 
uh, have shown that humans are not predisposed to violence. Uh, my question to you may sound naive, but I have to ask that. In your opinion, what is the fundamental reason at the root of the human creature which uh, makes him resort to violence repeatedly, cyclically, in the individual, societal, and the realm of nation states throughout history? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a facetious answer, and then I'll give you a serious one. I think human history is a history of horrors. I, once a friend said that to me, and I tend to agree. Um, but I think when I look inside of myself, when I look inside of myself, and I ask the question that you have asked me, you know, is that I have not trained my mind to go enough, to go from reactivity to response. I'm still very reactive, impulsively. You know, they have studied that it takes five seconds to decide to kill somebody. Five seconds is not premeditated at all. It's an impulse that takes five seconds. For a man to go to war and do what the, you know, what the people did to the people of Vietnam, you know, it was brainwashing. It was like, oh yes, you know, we're freeing our country from communists. It's all conditioning, it's all propaganda. Like somebody said, you know, Goebbels said, you know, the basis of all that we're doing is propaganda. He said it, it's propaganda. But fundamentally, I want to answer seriously your question. It is lack of self-knowledge, know thyself was written, you know, know thyself, know that you're not kind of responding, but you're reacting impulsively, you know, and, and study your mind, study yourself. It all starts with a human being. The essence of absolutely everything is the human being and the human being educated in a certain direction. Okay, thank you. Veronica, you are evolved. Joseph may also be a little evolved. But the fact of the matter is, most of the populace all over are not evolved and subject to impulses, including decision makers at the highest echelons. <laughs> yeah. So, your uh, approach of knowing thyself and change the world, I believe it's going to take a very long time. I agree. What do you say to that? I want to tell you a little story. You know, do you know Carl Gustav Jung, the, the psychoanalyst, the, the psychoanalyst, Carl Gustav Jung? So he was very sick and he had a vision. He was very worried because he was living the Second World War, that the Second World War would be the war that would end the life on the planet, on, the, you know, on Earth. Very, he, it was, he was really concerned. And so many of us should be concerned about that too. And basically he had a vision where he saw that, and you can take this or leave it, it doesn't matter, it's just a story. He saw that, yes, there would be a, a, a day of great destruction, a day that was coming soon. Great, but two thirds of humanity would be destroyed, but one third would remain to create a new humanity. That's the story I'm gonna leave you with. Do whatever you like with it. Okay, there was somebody else before Charlie, or was was I mistaken? Thank sorry, you, Raj. Raj. Thank you. All right, Raj. Go yeah. ahead. Will... Okay. Uh, to Veronica, the question I have is: uh, there are great issues, uh, great injustices in a woman's reproductive right, gay people's existence, legitimacy. And uh, 
what what is happening is that when a church church is the major opponent, how do we how do we protest peacefully or anyway that kind of injustices? You know. Can you hear me? Yeah, I heard you and I understood your question. Thank you. I think you know by creating community of like-minded people by really understanding your truth standing by the truth that you have understood which is not easy and then finding a community of like-minded people so that you get strength in numbers you know the other day i was watching um a Netflix movie called The Trial of the Chicago Seven or something like that. You know, the, the, the problem, as I could see it from watching that movie of The Trial of the Chicago Seven, was that, that, that there was no agreement between the people. There was no community amidst the seven, you know. I mean, they were all at, at each other's throats and stuff like that. So I think throughout history, injustices, People have stood against slavery. People have stood against all kinds of things. And there is a man called Bill Moyers. He's dead now, Bill Moyer. And he studied social movements. And, and what I'm talking about is how to form a social movement. You create social movements. So he studied social movements and they have a very distinct eight steps that they follow. He studied big social movements and they have eight steps that, that you follow. Um, and there, because one of the biggest problems in social movements is that it comes a moment where people lose faith, you know, like you think everything is lost. And the real secret to get to the point eight of a social movement that is successful is not to despair when you get to point five and it's a weakness in the flow of the movement. So if you stand together with your truth, with a community, if you learn how to communicate through nonviolent communication, because groups will always have conflict, but conflict is part of life. So you need to learn about how to deal with conflict. And then you go and you don't give up because of some, momentary failure or stuff like that, eventually, you know, with God on your side. Um, yeah, change will happen. Okay, Charlie, I believe you're next. No, I'm sorry. You had uh, Charlie and then they had Jeanne and then Janice. Charlie, did you go, need to go in with another question or not? No, I already asked it. Janice, it's hey. your turn. Janice, go ahead. Unmute, Janice. Unmute, Janice. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to thank Veronica for talking about trauma and how if we could get rid of our trauma, we, we, we could save our or uh, save each other. Um, because in 2012, I was with a bunch of uh, Black um, uh, uh, persons in our um, church, uh, in my United Methodist Women group. And I was talking about the general conference and how the general conference has to change our discipline to take all uh, mention of sex out of the discipline. And the black woman next uh, across from me said, said, if two women of the same, if two people of the same sex went up our center aisle for marriage, I would leave the church. And the lady next to me, both of these are my friends. Uh, and she said, uh, yeah, she, she believes the same thing. And I said, wait a minute, the United Methodist Church denied black membership. You had to go upstairs or in the back uh, for a few hundred years until about 1932. Uh, and the lady next to me said, um, uh, well, black people, are born that way. Homosexuals choose that way. And now I realize why the black, not 
all the black members, but many black members of my church are so opposed to LGBTQ rights. It's the trauma. You know, there is a man called Kazuhaga. Kazuhaga, Kazuhaga is Japanese. He lives in San Francisco mm. and um, very smart guy, super, super smart guy. And he, he started the, the East Bay Academy. And he also teaches kind of nonviolence like I do and stuff like that. He's part of our circle. And um, he totally believes that the, the root of racism is trauma. And he said this way be, before, you know, like Gabor Mate became so famous. He's been saying it for years, Kazu. The root of the problem, the, ra the racism problem in the United States is trauma, that it was never healed. You know, it has never healed yet, you know, and it gives food for thought, right? Uh, well, my question, I guess, I didn't ask the question, I just made the comment. And yeah. the question is, how can I approach these women uh, about that trauma and their attitudes towards um, homosexuals? I love your question. I love your questions because it gives me an opportunity to teach nonviolent communication. And so you do it like this, right? You don't confront them because you, you're going to be kind of like, you know, kicked out aside in no time. You can't win that one. So you say like this, when I hear you say, blah, 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 what they were saying, when I hear you say, I feel such pain because my need I'm just giving you the nonviolent communication recipe because my need, my deep need is for beloved community. So what I request from you, this is the process of nonviolent communication, what I observe, what I feel, what I need and what I request. So because I deeply need to live with beloved community and integrate and diversity, whatever your language is. So I request that we really look at this matter in, you know, in a serious way and that we decide to open ourselves to all human beings or whatever is your request, you make the request. But always when you are, it's a very useful formula. You know, when I see that, I feel it's all, you never point the finger to another. You're all the time from your own position. When I observe this, I feel this, I need blah, 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 and I request blah, 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 blah. Thank you. You're very welcome. I have to tell you, I so enjoyed being with you. I like your question. I like you as people. You're very diverse. <laughs> All of you, you're respectful. And so I'm very grateful for that. I, I enjoy, I enjoy being with you. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I love the evening and I thank you for being here. Anything else that I, I could answer, I'm happy to. Well, we still have some questions from uh, Margaret hasn't had a question yet, so uh, Gian, you've had a question already. So Margaret, why don't you go ahead before our speaker goes, and then we'll go to Gian. Um, what I was wondering is, um, you said that racism was a result of trauma, and I would like to know who who had the trauma and what what it was. Okay. The trauma is being a second class citizen or an inferior, uh, an inf being seen as an inferior human being. And therefore you can be bought and you can be sold. And if you don't do what I want, I'll cut your leg. The, you name it, the, a whole generation of trauma. When, when um, Obama, Mrs. Obama, what's her name? Michelle. Michelle Obama's, you know, her famous speech, you know, I'm living in a house created by slaves. She's naming the trauma. Well, but that's not what racism is. Racism is white people making themselves special and then 
denying rights and privileges and human rights for black people. So the racism isn't what happened to blacks. The racism is what white people are doing. That's, that, that, so that's so, so what I'm saying is the racism is white people being racist. So what kind of, what trauma caused that? No, it's, the, it's exactly the white people being racist and therefore that racism of the white people causing the trauma in the black people. Yeah, but what causes the racism in the white people? I mean, uh -huh. I, I have my own opinions about that, but you're okay. saying trauma causes it. And so no, I'm no, no, no. The, the trauma is the experience. It was never he, it's still, it's still, no. and you can see that what, with the reaction to George Floyd, Floyd's assassination. Yeah, but what, I'm trying to find out what kind of trauma, <clears throat> if you're saying that trauma creates racism, then no, no. trauma it's, it's, created it's, racism in white people. No, no, just a second. The trauma is experienced by the people of color and it still has not been healed. That's the trauma. And the white people, and unless the white people continue, right, to cause separation and to cause all these things, they're just reinforcing that initial trauma. That's what, that's what I meant. Okay, but, the, but all right, that's fine. But the, in black people, it's, it's, okay, it's racism that causes trauma not trauma that causes racism. That's right, exactly, Margaret, you got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fine. Okay. Yeah. Right. I just, you, the second part to your question that I want to answer. What is it in white people that, that we need, because I have to include myself as a white person, what is it in us white people that we need to feel superior, that we need to do this power over thing on other people, that we need to subjugate, you know, that we have to look deeply in ourselves. Again, it's the same answer that I get, gave to Joseph. Why, 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 why does the dog lick its balls? Because it can. Can you let her answer for the, what she's doing? Can you let her finish oh. what she's saying, please? <laughs> so I look at this, you know, like my sister was married to an oil guy. So she was expatriated in all these countries like Indonesia and stuff like that. And I visited and at a party, a woman, you know, a white woman said, oh, Indonesians are so lucky they have us because really their brains like a piece or a piece of something, you know? And I could not believe it. She was saying this quite loudly in a party. You know, it was her conviction that the white man of, because of technology, because of studies, because it is superior to an Indonesian person who doesn't have all of these things to prop up their identity, you know? I studied, I did this. And therefore that becomes like a way to subjugate another and not look at the profound feeling of lack of inferiority, of low self-esteem that you have because you know, you're know you just projecting it. You know, I am superior to that person. That's one aspect, psychological aspect. Okay, um, who's... Uh... All right, Gian, you want a question next? Go ahead, if our speaker's willing. Oh, well, um, that actually reminded me <laughs> of, a, of a Native American story um, of two wolves. <laughs> Us, we have two wolves, either hatred, uh, greed, um, superiority, or we have uh, love and collaboration, compassion, uh, whatever it wins, we, whichever we feed is the one that wins. So at the individual level, in a way it's, it's, in a way it's easier because like we can make a decision to feed the loving, compassionate, side of us so we will grow to be more compassionate and collaborative person uh, but but at a societal level it's harder it's harder because there are many 
variables that are out of our control. Um, and I don't particularly want to be an activist, um, but if the situation rises, I think if you have a strong conviction, what is right and have certain courage, you can act at a moment to, to encourage the, the loving and compassionate and to uh, fight against uh, racism. But if we don't have the, the fortitude inside us, then we are more likely to complain, to whine and not able to really act. So in a way, I think it, it's more useful to work within ourselves. So we'll be, at least we'll be the agent of resisting racism. And when the occasion arises, we can be an agent for supporting the equality and equity of all people of all back backgrounds. Um, and that's the lesson I, I took um, from my readings and from Veronica's talk. Thank you so much. And I, I agree, and it comes a moment, you know, I think it was Gurdjieff who said this, you know, the first task is to do this, to use Gandhi's word, process of purification, of self-purification. So you work on yourself, you know, until you're reached to a certain point, and then you are ready to kind of go out. This Gurdjieff said it better. I'm, I'm trying to remember. And then you're ready to go out and to be a model and to society for others to emulate your to be a light unto the world or to, but first you have to do this. And then you don't have to do anything. Life will take care of that. You know, when you're ready, life will put you in a situation and in a position to be able to be a model for others of your own light and, and you know, kind of emulate that light. And I believe that to be true. You know, the stages, and as somebody has <clears throat> said, you know, there are very, very few people who, who do that uh, journey. And, and, and the two wolves is a wonderful story. It became so popular, you know, but the, the one you feed, you know, the one you feed is the one that's going to win. But for me, the fundamental in that story, what is the condition to create the consciousness of choice? <laughs> because that's a precondition, right? The consciousness of being able to choose which wolf you're going to feed, right, Jen? Yes. Right. So, so that's the work. That's the job of us as human beings. Mm -hmm. Yes, Raj. Yes, me. Uh, I have a question in that. More to question I asked before. The politics uh, and. Uh, general population reacts so well to hate, mm -hmm. going back to Trump, you know, and, and, and looks like uh, so many people are predisposed mm -hmm. to put down somebody else and undermine somebody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, where, where it comes from? And, mm -hmm. and I mean, it, this is before we start even, peaceful or violent protest. This is before the protest, you know, and this thing exists and it is so huge. You know, I mean, I mean, Trump has a popularity so big and, and it is not from love, it is more from hate and we can see it openly on a march after march after march, you know, speech after speech after speech, it's a plain hate and he's not hiding it. That's He's right. saying it, you know. Can I give my you question. my take on Trump? Can I give you my, it's just my take on Trump. It's just nothing but my take on Trump. Again, I think Trump is not an isolated phenomenon. He represents a mentality. He, he's not an isolated phenomenon. He's kind of just like an icon of a popular kind of... As a psychologist, and I'm speaking here as a psychologist, here's what I think. Such an enormous uh, piece of 
the North American population carries such enormous sense of low self-esteem and guilt and, you know, like not feeling good in my skin. And there comes somebody who says, it's okay to be like that. Look, I'm like that. It's okay to be like that, right? And so everybody can push down and repress these feelings of low self-esteem and lack of self-love because somebody, writing this, I'll get something for you. Okay. Somebody comes and says, it's okay to be a liar. It's okay to be there. It's okay, it's okay, you know, to name, to treat women like, yeah, just something pussy or whatever. And so you, you, the president can do it, so can I. Great, free of my guilt, you know? This one possible element in all of that, that, that played in that. But I just want to say he's not an isolated phenomenon. He's not impossible. So anyway, I will stop here, if that's okay with you. <clears throat> and thank you so much for inviting me, Charlie. And um, thank you. All I really right. I know you got to go, so go ahead. Thank you for giving me that uh, permission, Tim. It's been fun, fun for me. And anything that I, you have my email, feel right. free to write me. I'm always here to serve. Thank you. Okay. All right, Veronica, we'll have a good night. You too. Yes, thank you, Veronica. Thank you. Blessings. I'm All sorry, right. I've, been, I've been a bit too robust. Well, does anybody else have comments tonight or not? Yeah, well, Tim, uh, maybe we should have a comment period. I don't care what you wind up doing, Charlie. I just, uh, I'm freaking fine. Well, I'm, getting I'm not doing anything. You're the chair. Well, if you want to keep going, keep going for a while. I mean, I got a well, lot. Well, why don't you ask the audience, does anybody like to make comments? And see I wouldn't you. mind talking, Charlie, I'm talking. All right, well, yeah. we'll do it. All right. Well, what we'll do then is our rebuttal. Well, we'll do a rebuttal period next, and each of you will get up to five minutes to have your say. Um, so, you know, if you have a rebuttal, go ahead and say it. And if you feel like sticking around, go ahead. But the meeting won't be shut down until we stop recording. So, you know, I'm just going to say a couple of minor things myself. I'm kind of getting tired when we book a speaker that they all of a sudden have to leave early when they know they have to be here till nine o'clock. And, uh, you know, the one thing I am getting sick of, it's, it's not, it's not getting us in here. We're having a lot of people drop off at the college and I just wish we'd be meeting live again soon, but that's all I'm going to say. So go ahead. Who's ever next? Go ahead. We'll give you five minutes a piece. Kevin, if you want to speak, speak now. I'll let somebody else go first. All right, I'll go. Uh, I'll be eclectic as usual. I've only got a few remarks. Um, the topic was peace advocacy, and a number of years, many years ago, uh, I was approached by a young man in college to put together a chapter of the War Resisters League. And in one evening, you needed to have 10 people demonstrate the sign that they would like to have a chapter. And in one meeting, I got 10, 10 signatures at the college. That was, has to be 25 years ago. That group is still in existence. And we do have a website. You can Google just WRL, War Resisters League, Chicago. Um, and you can see it. There's some other links to other peace groups. Uh, they, War Resisters have a bit of a different approach to peace advocacy. They are strongly, uh, they believe in civil disobedience as a method of influencing policy. Uh, other people have other approaches. Brad Little, who was a regular at the college, uh, had a peace brigade, the Christian peace brigades, which actually go to 
uh, areas of conflict and try to uh, foster settlement, which is uh, somewhat what Kathy Kelly uh, uh, has approached uh, to bringing about peace, but those are the Christian peace teams, peacekeeping teams. Um, the, we have a very small group of seasoned peace advocates here in Chicago. Uh, they're working right now on a no first strike nuclear uh, legislation and policy of the United States. No first strike. If anybody is interested, they have meetings about every two weeks or so. Uh, it, please get in touch with me. My email's on the website and I'll ask them. They have a, an email group, which uh, I will furnish to you that you can support subscribe. Um, I like our speaker because I, for many years ago, I had a, actually it was a bumper sticker that said, let peace begin with me. And I never totally comprehended it. Well, I realized the teachings of Gandhi and so forth, but uh, she and the, that organization are strong advocates of that approach that uh, I guess you have to be the right frame and character in order to achieve uh, your aims in this regard. Uh, the only thing is I wanted to ask her, I'd like to know like, even if I let, if I'm a very peaceful person, how does that affect the policy of the United States and the war machine and the military? Uh, I can be a very peaceful person and instill peace in those around me, but that there's no significant effect upon what this nation does. And last of all, you people like to always say, be critical of me and say nasty things about Charles all the time. I hear, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna raise my hand, like she says, Stop. He's in war. I've never said anything bad about you in my life. <laughs> All the time. Stop. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding you. All right. Thank everyone for coming out tonight. I hope you profited by the program. Thank you. All right. Who else has uh, other things to say for rebuttals? Oh, I've got had my hand up. Go, go ahead, um, Margaret. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't oh, see. No, that's you. okay. You're, 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 you're not with the program at this point. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank well, I would thank the speaker if she was here. I appreciated her uh, comment and she reinforced the message that I know we all need to hear is that we do have to associate ourselves with like-minded individuals and work as a group because the group's voice is always louder than a single person uh, with the exception of Greta Thunberg. There you are. Uh, there's always an exception. Um, but um, what an interesting young woman. At any rate, what I wanted, I, I'm trying to send a message to Kevin and I, I'm sorry, I think it's Kevin. It's, and no, I, it's Kelvin. Actually. Kelvin. Oh, I Kelvin. was named after the scientist. Well, you know, the, my problem is I'm getting old and I- There's an L, there's an L in there. Yeah, I, I try to yeah, wear glasses and see things, but sometimes I don't do it well. Anyway, um, but it was about racism. And, and he said, my comment made it like it was a white thing. And yeah, it is a white thing. And in this country, it is a white thing. It may be in other countries at other times and in other social groups, um, maybe. But the whole point is that it, as a divide and conquer uh, tactic, the um, English colonialists, gave, identified white people as a group for the very first time in, 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 in colonial law in the 1600s after the Bacon's Rebellion. It wasn't written, white people was not a phrase or the white race or the white whatever was not used as a characteristic in the law before that time. And what they did is to, uh, separate the groups that joined together 
to rebel against the colonial government to uh, improve their uh, lot as, as people who were freedmen from being indentured slaves and some uh, Af people of African descent who had bought their freedom or had been uh, freed by their masters on their death and their wills or whatever. And um, the, uh, the small group of Native American peoples who acted with them to make this big rebellion in, in Virginia that almost succeeded and scared the pants off of the colonial government. So afterwards, they did a really good thing of dividing and conquering. They identified a group of people who were Anglo-Saxons as the white race. And then they gave the white race special privileges and denied privileges to everybody else. The right to vote, the right to own property, the right to own weapons, the, uh, the whole nine yards of the whole. And ever since then, the people who, were got, who got those special privileges really did feel more that they were higher than the, uh, unless they were special. Uh, unless they had the awareness to realize that they're being manipulated, that, that they didn't. And it's been reinforced in law and the law that created the fact that when some place was colonized, if the people weren't Christian, they were by definition, the Pope said this, by definition, they were slaves. By definition, any property that the colonists, that the Christian colonists seized they, they had it, they owned it, just by definition of being conquering ca Catholic or Christian colonists, they owned it. That's because it. Because, because, and, because. And yeah, that, yeah, but that yeah, kept yeah, being yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's tribalism. Um, that law was put in US common law and was cited in a case in 2006 that judged against an Indian tribe in this country. It's not gone away. That it was the basis of manifest destiny. It was the basis of the Monroe Doctrine, the whole yeah. thing. But it keeps being reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. After the Civil War that freed the slaves, after Reconstruction, when the troops were withdrawn from the South, the KKK came up, all those bloody monuments went up in the 1890s. All, all, all of the, the, uh, the real profound um, discrimination things that happened. People, there were 3,000 people lynched in the South during that whole period up until the middle. That, were, that case is I'm, still used in labor law, Margaret. Oh, no that, kidding. Yes. What? Yes, it's used. Anyway, so, well, look it up. It's, it's, it, it's in the, I don't know. If, if anybody wants to uh, send it to Charlie and you'll send it to me and I'll, I'll send Ma you. Ma 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 Margaret, Margaret, Ma 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 hold on. Ma Ma uh, okay, wait a minute. This is my time. If you Ma guys want to make a comment, Eliana, this is my time. Let me talk. I just want to say no. thank you. Thank you. No, no. Okay, you gave just, me. You're interrupting me. Okay, so um, anyway, so this has been reinforced with the black laws, with the Jim Crow laws, with the segregation until the, uh, the mid 60s where they finally passed civil rights. The mid 60s was the first time where many black women were able to vote and not everywhere either for that matter because that was part of the struggle. Um, so, so, you know, it just keeps, and, and now with the, the um, the police brutality and, and police persecution and the John Burge, people should know that. And that that's not just in Chicago, that's all over this country. So, you know, the, this, this, this um, I'm getting senile, so I'm forgetting all my words, but it is persecution of, of, of people who are black by people who are white or people who are immigrants or people who are from Latin America or people who are indigenous people. There's still a, whole, a huge problem with racism up, up here in Wisconsin and, and in uh, Michigan and in the, in the upper Midwest that, and, and in um, Arizona and, and New Mexico and, and um, Utah and California and all that. There's a huge amount of racism against Native American peoples. So, and it's all, in law, they're passing laws about 
You have to have an address to vote. When for a million years you had a post office box in the high desert plains in Montana. So, you know, all of this is in the law. It's all meant to control people who are not white male Christian Christians, you know, all the, all the, the uh, and, and, and straight white male Christians, I have to add. And so all the homophobic stuff, all the racism, all the xenophobia, all the misogyny and sexism and all that, that's all part of it. And it's Mother, white, in Mother, this country, it's white males. It's a white- Mother, can I ask you a question, please? You asked me a question, right? Uh, I, I can only answer it in this. Um, the city I live in is Liverpool. Um, we are the beneficiary of the worst form of racism. But with this built, he was, city was built on slavery, you know? Yeah. Um, the, but the thing is, we acknowledge that, we accept that, and we move on. You know, uh, we, 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 I can't apologize for my, my forefathers because I'm not my forefathers. We, we, we have the worst, uh, we're built on, on that kind of tribalism, but we encourage the best kind of tribalism in the fact that if you are of this city, then you are, you are one of us. And, and as a city, we can turn around to Rupert Murdoch and say, <laughs> yes, right. I agree. You cannot buy the most popular newspaper in Britain in this city, The Sun, a, a murder publication because they pissed us off. I put a thing on the chat there. You can look it up. Hillsborough disaster, whatever, right? You have to accept the fact that you were twats in the past. You know, that, 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 that you, have, you can't... Dis, you can't dismiss that trauma. You, you, I, I, I've got uh, Afro-Caribbean friends, whatever. Uh, you know, uh, I can't dismiss that their ancestors were slaves. This is, I can't dismiss it. You know, but you know, guess what? I was much, just as much. My ancestors were, ancestors were just as much likely to become an American because. Britain transported more convicts to America than they did to Australia. <laughs> no one says indentured servants and like that. The, yeah, you know, indentured thing. They were convicts as well, you know? Yeah. What convicts? Working class convicts. Oh, I, I, they, I, I, they, I, were, they were guilty of stealing a loaf of bread. But I think the problem mm -hmm. with this country is that we do not acknowledge that. Yeah. We have not made any real acknowledgement by, as a country, of, of, the, of the theft of, of Native lands, of the genocide, both physical and cultural, of Native American peoples that is still going on that uh, that that the slavery that that just you know unbelievable. There's only there's one city, and now I can't remember what it is that has started to do. Or maybe it's Evanston that started to do reparations in this entire country that was built by slaves. You know, we the, the slaves built the U.S. Capitol building, and slaves built the, uh, the uh, cotton industry and slaves built the industries, uh, some of the industries in the North even, until they started importing people from I, Europe like I'm, I'm, sit I'm sitting in a house that was, that was built in like 1860, before, uh, the, before the Civil War. Yeah, but, you're, but England freed their slaves in, uh, made yeah, slaves in but, yeah, like but, 1840s yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah but get, Guess it was getting rich off the importation of cotton. Yeah. Oh, somebody well, wrote, uh, I'm sorry, somebody has a citation in the chat about the papal bull. 
um, the, uh, yeah. Well, actually there were a number of uh, papal bulls that were issued. There was one that was issued in 1493. <laughs> that is more of a, the history, uh, more of the law that, that, was, that our law is based on, or more of a dictate that our law was based on. But there were a number of these papal bulls that were issued even before that because the uh, European colonial powers were colonizing the Netherlands. I mean, Spain colonized the Netherlands. And, um, and then of course, the places in Africa that they were colonizing and the attempts to colonize um, China and Japan and, and places in, in, in Southeast Asia. All of that was based on these papal bulls and, and, and they were stop? in the 14th century. Do you, think it doesn't stop? do you think the problems we have in Iran at this moment has nothing to do with the fact that you were colonizing Iran and putting a, 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 a monarch in there? You know, this bastion of democracy, put a, put a shah there. Yep. Margaret, can I say something very quickly? I'm um, just thank you so much for educating me. And you just thank you so much for... <laughs> for teaching me something more about this country. Because I come from country, we really, we have so many nationalities from 15 Republic, you name it, Tajikian, Armenian, uh, Uzbekian, Latvian, Estonian. You know, I don't remember we had slavery or some uh, discrimination or some racism. Even, you know, Jewish people uh, was in Russia so much in my Baltic country where I come from. You know, I don't no, Latvian people treat Jewish people so with respect and nice, you know, and Russians too. So we never, I'm so glad we never had, you know, experience like really racism. So, but yes, anyway, you thank you so yes, much for educating me. Thank you, yeah, Margaret. In Ma Russia, thank you. In Russia, the peasants were locked to a particular parcel of land which someone owned. Now, they later came along and once a year, just like under feudalism, you could escape. There was a two-week period. And I, it's, I don't want to get into detail, but the person, actually, yeah, you were fixed part of the farm, the part of a piece of the land. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was this peculiar form. But since you were on that land, you came under the jurisdiction of the individual who owned it. It wasn't two weeks, it was a year and a day. <laughs> no, that's feudalism. In Russia, it was different. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'd like to comment, Tim, whenever you have time. Go right ahead, Raj, when you're ready. Uh, I think Veronica had a lot of knowledge and uh, she gave very good answers to questions. The the what uh, Charles was saying about attack on him. I mean, I have I have been decision on me all the time. Attack goes on, and and attacks are because I want to speak freely on issues, and group doesn't want me to speak. Uh, our pro our problems are so serious. And uh, solutions are not easy. In a traditional way, we solve the pro problem. And even a protest doesn't seem to work. I think we have a new method of solving our problem because we have a new strategy, new methodology. Here's something I suggest. One thing is education. My, if, unless minority is educated, and Whoever are educated in minority, I see them making a progress. If there's a wider education of minority and a successful, I think they can, that will be the thing that will change their status and that will change the perception of them and less crime, of course. And uh, education, if white people do not have education, they are going to have a problem also. Second thing is that uh, church. 
The church has a great influence in this country. When a people, even the conservatism on the issues, it has church mediated. And uh, in a church, and not only a Christian church, but Jewish, Hindu, Muslims, all, all religions. We are not teaching values anymore. We are teaching the hate. And uh, it is time that we insist. And uh, church teaches these people the value. When there is service on Sunday, they talk about at least partly on the values. They should be good to your neighbor. You should love people. You should not discriminate. And there is, there is nothing there. I, I go to church so many times and I go and I, I listen. It's all about Jesus or all about Krishna, you know, and they say, hey, you got to remember that, you got to remember that, but nothing to practice. And that bothers me. And I think it is time that a community bring a pressure on churches that, hey, what about values? And their values is only hate and no love. And uh, other thing, uh, politics, in our politics, there are qualified a value speaker, people who really care for everybody, are not there anymore. People are not talking about values, they're talking about winning. There is only winning, there is no values. And one of the things I think, we, I believe we can do it is that, that a mass email campaign, go to Supreme Court justices, email and letter campaign that, hey, you are wrong. And uh, what, is your, what are your values? Tell us. Okay, what you believe in and why? And uh, I, I, this abortion issue is really, really bothers me. I rather have no abortion, less abortion, okay, to possible. But for a woman not to give right to them, they don't understand. I, I, for a woman who doesn't want a child and she has to go through those months of pregnancy, and, and, and uh, always suffering mentally. And what happened to child? <clears throat> when, when, when mothers doesn't have a sense of mind and she resents that child, what happens to the child? And we, we are not talking about, and we got to talk about when those, those people who are against, who are for, against abortion or against women's right, we are talking about what happens? What happens to the child? And we have a lots of lots of kids grow up and lots of young people they are lost. You know, they are not loved. You know, they come, they come, come out of they, every, babies, but babies are not trained, babies are not given value, babies are not given love, and we need more of that. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Who's next? Uh, this is Doug. I've been very right, tired, so I've just been laying down. I've only been able to listen to part of it. Um, I'm uh, I'm afraid I might have actually agreed with Charles tonight uh, because uh, he pointed out uh, that this nonviolent stuff can only get you so far. Um, I uh, I really uh, I I regret that I myself am such an unworthy. Uh, individual that uh, I cannot ever even hope to reach the uh, the uh, greatness of uh, individuals that have high ethical uh, standards like uh, Gandhi, for example, uh, or, or Greta Thunberg. <laughs> I can't, uh, I can't hope to reach those, those uh, people. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, we always, however, say it's heightened. I mean, I don't know why it just happens to be that the ethical, the ethical standard is up towards the um, heavens for some reason. We think of the heavens as being, uh, think of the good places being up in the clouds. I don't know. It's a little strange, but uh, um, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't always work out that way that uh, the ethical people are uh, <laughs> win or are superior uh, uh, and uh, of course the, the largest example of that is that the, there was resistance to the Nazis, uh, nonviolent resistance uh, 
when they uh, when they first took over, but uh, but they rolled the people up very quickly, and then you know the White Rose uh, is the most famous uh, name of a of a resistance group, uh, uh, and they were they were small in numbers. They they came in a little later. It was after the uh, after the Second World War started that they uh, gained notoriety, but they were almost all just rolled up and. Uh, and either killed or put in concentration camps and uh, uh, didn't survive. Uh, so the nonviolence only works uh, in particular societies or particular times in history. And uh, it's a sad thing that we are, as humans, we're genetically apparently predisposed to this tribalism that's uh, been mentioned. And uh, I find it very sad um, when I'm in a particular mood. Uh, uh, but then, you know, when I reflect that I am part of the white race and the white race is, <laughs> has been able to be in a superior position, at least to take advantage of uh, the law and the, uh, uh, the economic uh, uh, the ability to, to have at least a, uh, a better chance of surviving economically in, in the society here. Um, uh, I, I certainly do not go out of my way to uh, say, well, I, I renounce that. I don't want any any part of that superiority. I have ne never resulted in me, you know, again, raising, <laughs> rising up to any heights of economic superiority, but at least it's been a, for me able to, to survive being that I'm not an aggressive personality and I'm kind of actually a coward and uh, in many respects, <laughs> but I survive an economic system even dis, despite that lack of uh, aggressiveness. So, so I'm uh, not able to make a very cogent point, but um, you know, the main points are that uh, yes, nonviolence is uh, I can't prove it, but it seems to be a higher ethical um, position to take uh, or something to aspire to. It would be it would be uh, wonderful if nonviolence um, succeeded always. Uh, uh, but uh, unfortunately, the dark history of humanity and, and in this country uh, uh, shows that um, uh, white supremacy and uh, uh, taking advantage of you know temporary um, uh, technological advances, you know, enabled, which enabled uh, the, uh, <laughs> the uh, invaders uh, to lord it over the uh, Native Americans. Uh, 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 those, those, those were the things that mattered uh, in, uh, in what happened um, and uh, who's on top and who's on the bottom, <laughs> I guess. Uh, um, I guess um, I just don't know that there's any real answer. Uh, it's kind of funny that Christianity was supposed to be based on the teachings of an individual um, that was uh, uh, may or may not have existed, but was called uh, Jesus and uh, was given this uh, uh, title of the Christ, which is a Greek uh, title, actually. Uh, I think it came from the Greek, um, uh, uh, Christos, anyway. Uh, but that there was this religion that was founded on a nonviolent idea that ideas of ethics and uh, nobleness would uh, somehow, you know, make people feel better by doing good works and that uh, that, that could have a chance of being a governing principle of humanity. Uh, and it's it only worked in, in lip service and uh, you had the Spanish Inquisition instead and you had those invaders, as has been pointed out by others uh, in, this, in this forum, uh, who you know, stomped on the Native Americans as, as an example of the sad state of uh, you know, Christian, Christians lording it over others, even though they, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, teachings of their founder would have otherwise. Uh, so I feel very saddened tonight. I, I think I'll probably just fall asleep. I feel um, weak 
both physically and mentally. Uh, maybe I could come up with better arguments for nonviolence if I was uh, not physically uh, <laughs> feeling like it's been a long day. So Doug, take, I'm gonna take play care, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for Doug, being on. I'm going to play top trumps with you. Okay, let's play top trumps. Okay, you got the Nazis. Okay, pretty good card, right? Who okay. was the biggest? Who was the biggest empire the world has ever seen? The it British. Was probably Genghis Khan For, or the Romans? No, no, no. Three yeah, quarters British. of the world. We fucking own three quarters of the world, right? Who beat us? Gandhi. Well, actually, the Gandhi, Vietnamese, Gandhi, the Vietnamese uh, defeated Gandhi the United got States. Exactly uh, <laughs> what he wanted. No, right? Kelvin is talking about Nazis. Britain. We Gandhi. beat the Nazis and Gandhi beat us. End of. Well, Gandhi would have had no chance against the Nazis. They would have just. Put yeah, him but in he beat us and we beat the Nazis. Rounded him up. Yeah, we beat the, so we beat the Nazis. That's, Trump's a, that's an wins. interesting point to point out and we were slightly better than them ethically but uh, I mean it's how we treated African Americans at the time of the Second World War I don't know anyway, that we, anyway, it would be much better non-violence is top Trump I admire Gandhi as a human being but um, he 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 also was aware of the fact that his tactics would have no there, there are letters that yes, he wrote yes, where yes, scholars yes. have 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 found out that yeah, yes, Gandhi was he, well aware of the fact that but, his tactics but he had beat no the guy that beat the success guy. against the Nazis whatsoever. He was aware. Yeah, of but that. he beat the guy that beat the guy. Who's next? All right, who's next? Looks like Raj wants to do something there. Raj, you want to say anything else? No, yeah, I go ahead, want, Raj. I, I just want to say one thing. Gandhi was uh, traveling from London to India and uh, on a way, so Hitler requested him to meeting with him and he, he declined absolutely. Anyway, that's it. Huh. I'm anxious to hear from Bob Matter if he's got any comments. <laughs> he's quiet today. He's, he's present in name only. Oh, he's just probably listening. Well, if no one's got anything else to add. Uh, All right, I'm going to... Going cool. once, going twice. All right, I'm going to stop the recording of the meeting and uh, let's wish everybody a good night then, okay? Good yeah, night. I, did, I did put the original... Someone put the original thing that I referred to in the chat, the, the Doctrine of Discovery. Okay. If anybody's interested, the citation is...